We're here today with Wharton professors Joe Simmons and Kate Massey to talk about some of their new research, which focuses on algorithm aversion and how to stop it. Joe and Kate, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So first of all, could you give us a brief summary of this research? And also, I know this is actually a, this paper is actually a follow-up to something that you had done previously. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, uh, so we're studying a phenomenon called algorithm aversion, which is basically the tendency for people to not want to follow specific evidence-based rules when they make decisions, even though a lot of the research that we do in judgment and decision-making shows that that's exactly the way that you should be making judgments and forecasts. So uh, a lot of people just want to you know, rely on their gut or go by the seat of their pants. They don't want to rely on consistent evidence-based rules, and they should. And so we've been studying for a couple of years now you know, first of all, why don't they, or under what circumstances don't they want to rely on these algorithms? And then our second paper, the one you, you asked about, is about, well, how to get people to be more likely to rely on algorithms. And so the answer to our first question, we basically found that people are, if you tell them you're going to make a forecast, an algorithm is going to give you some advice, or you can go with your own opinion. What do you want to do? And you just ask them that. They're actually okay with saying, I'll use the algorithm. However, once you give them some practice and let them see how their algorithm performs, now all of a sudden they don't want to use it anymore. And that's because they see the algorithm make mistakes. And once they see algorithms or computers make mistakes, they don't want to do it anymore. Even though the algorithm or computer is going to make a smaller mistake or more infrequent mistakes, than they themselves are going to make. But algorithms are supposed to be perfect. Right. So people want algorithms to be perfect, and they expect them to be perfect, even though, of course, what we really want is for them to simply be um, a little more, a, a little better than, than the humans. Um, and so our second paper, our first paper is kind of pessimistic and shows that once people see the algorithms do its thing, they don't want to use it. Our second paper shows that actually you can get people to use algorithms as long as you give them a little bit of control over it. So you say, the algorithm tells you that this person is going to have a GPA of 3.2. What do you think their GPA is going to be? And they don't want to just go with the 3.2 that the algorithm says, but if you say, you can adjust it a little bit, you can adjust it by 0.1 then they're like, oh, okay, I'm fine to use the algorithm. And so we basically find as long as you give people a little bit of control over these things, they're more likely to use them. And that's, that's pretty good news. So th this is, we, we, we operationalize this in experimental context, but we're motivated by real world context. So mm -hmm. some of the early ideas for this research came from working with companies where we would go in with models for decision making, and in particular this is about hiring and recruiting new employees. And based on many years worth of data and some pretty good analytics, we'd have advice, and we were sure that we had the best advice going, and yet those organizations would be reluctant to use it because they want to rely on just their intuition. They're reluctant to use those models. So it's very common in hiring. It's very common in performance evaluation. It's even common increasingly in some fields where they automate decision making like how to manage a hedge fund or what should the sales forecast be for some product. So those are all places where increasingly automatically generated forecast or advice is available. We call it an algorithm. And the final decision maker has discretion over whether they listen to that advice or whether they use their own or they use some blend. So your key takeaway was basically that people are a little less averse to using algorithms if they have some control. But there was a conclusion that surprised you in how much control you had to give them or you could give them to make them feel better. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, we, we were agnostic on how much control would be necessary to kind of get them to buy in. The downside of giving them control is they start degrading the algorithm. They make, they're not as, in most domains, they're not as good as the model. And so the more of their opinion is in there, the worse it performs. And so in some sense, you'd like to give them as little control as possible and yet still have them buy in. We didn't know what the answer to that would be. And we got early evidence that it wasn't going to be very much. And then we started testing the limits of it. And we found that we could give them just a little bit of control, you know, move something around 5% or so. And um, they would be much more interested in using the algorithm. And then if you give them more, it doesn't increase the lift at all. It's just a, you give them a little bit, it's about the same as giving them moderate influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and as, as Kate was mentioning, what's nice about that is that every when they adjust the algorithms, they make them worse. But if they can only adjust it this much, they can only make it that much worse. And they're more like and since they're just more likely to use it in that case, their final judgments wind up being correlated with the algorithm close to perfectly. And so 
we can't get people to use algorithms 100%, but we can get them to use algorithms 99%. And, and that, that massively improves their judgments. So tell me a little bit about, so with this paper, like applying it in real life, like how could, if I'm a business owner or even someone who's going to be charged with using one of these algorithms, how might I apply this research in real life? So the, the overarching lesson would be that you don't m simply impose a monolithic model or a black box model and say this is how you use judgment. People will fight that. This is how you, this is how you should codify your decision making. People will fight that. You want to let them have discretion. And that's going to look different in different places. So consider uh, graduate school making admissions. They, they rank their applicants, and at some point they cut a line, and they make exceptions, they move people around. You can automate some of that process. Even if you use their judgment to provide inputs to the model, you can use the, a model, an automatic model, to say, these are the folks that you should take. On one hand, you could say, here's the model, this is what it says, take it or leave it, we're gonna automate the process. You'll basically have a revolt on your hand. But if you say, here's a model, it's advisory, we suggest that you consider it. If you want to move things around, move them around. We've actually worked with schools on, in, in exactly this way, and what you find is that they're a little skeptical early on, they lean on the model some, and over time they lean on the model more, and eventually they're practically using the entire model as it is, even though they have discretion to change as much as they want. So it's sort of a get-to-know-you process. There's very much a get-to-know-you process with it. And now, how important is it with these models? I mean, just, I would also think the presentation of it would be important that you make sure that people know that they have this control, that you're sort of presenting it in such a way that like, here's what you can control and here's how much control, or can it be a little more veiled than that? Yeah, I basically think the important thing is to avoid an all or nothing framing. Like you are all, you, you have to stick with the algorithm 100% of the time. If people think that based on how you've described it, um, they are going to push back. But if instead you can frame it as, you know, even like 99% of the time we're going to go with the algorithm, but you have the option to change the algorithm or to not go with the algorithm at a given moment, I think that that's going to, going to make people a lot more amenable to using it. I mean, another context that this might matter is like self-driving cars. I mean, you can imagine people saying like, uh, not feeling comfortable being in a self-driving car if they have no control whatsoever. But if they say, well, there's this sort of thing you can do, it's a little bit difficult and unusual, but there's this thing you can do to gain control over the car in circumstances where you might need to do it. Now, we found that people never need to use this, but it does exist. We would predict that in that circumstance, people would be much more amenable to getting in, uh, getting in a self-driving car because there's some control. It's like autopilot is usually safer than real pilots, but people want a pilot there. Even though lots of plane crashes are due to pilot error, they feel better about that. And so I think our research sort of speaks to that a bit. Mm -hmm. Now, are there other stories in the news that might apply to this research? Because I know self-driving cars have obviously been in the news quite a bit. How about election forecasts? Yeah, so I think, you know, back in November, of course, we had a presidential election that surprised the world. <laughs> um, and there were a bunch of people out there predicting based on past polling information, what the election was going to, to look like. Like uh, probably the most famous case is Nate Silver, who's, who writes for 538.com. And he basically said that there is a 70% chance that Hillary Clinton would win the election and a 30% chance that Donald Trump would win. Um, and of course, you know, Donald Trump won. And there was a lot of pushback against Nate Silver at the end of it being like, you know, you were, you know, you were wrong. Um, and, and we think in part your, because your model was your wrong. Model, your, your model, model was wrong. Was wrong. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, that it wasn't necessarily wrong because 30% happens 30% uh, of the time. But I think that it's, it's the kind of thing where when individual, I think when individual pundits go out there and say one thing is going to happen, I don't think they get as much blowback as when the person who uses statistics and the model and an, and an algorithm that people expect to be right 100% of the time when they actually wind up getting it wrong. Uh, in that particular case. So I think the blowback that we've seen um, uh, in, in the direction of Nate Silver has been in line with what we found before. So it circles back to that first paper where people are just much harder on models and algorithms when they err than they are on people. They're just more forgiving. They, we've explored it a little bit, but the bottom line is that they're held to a higher standard. Yeah. Now does that, I mean, does that make sense? Or is that, I mean, I would think, I can see why people would feel that way. Although no one's perfect or anything is perfect. Well, the, one, there are a variety of reasons we think people do this. One of them is that they believe that people can improve over time, whereas a model is relatively fixed, and that's the way they 
feel anyway. Both of those things are not necessarily true. Models can improve over time, and people don't necessarily improve over time. So the psychology of that, I think, is compelling, but it's not necessarily correct. Um, there, there, there certainly will be some settings where people can improve more than a model, but we think that people have that intuition more than they actually should. Now, is there anything that kind of sets this research apart from other work that's been done in this area? That we're, we're not the first to talk about the difference between model judgment and human judgment. It's been established for decades now that models are quite mm -hmm. good. We're relatively early in to trying to understand why that is and then how you fix it. Yeah, so, right. So not many people have documented previously the reasons why people are averse to using algorithms. There's been some anecdotal research. There's been some writings about how people don't like these things, but no one's really looked at it systematically before. And so that's, uh, that's where we sort of started. And, and again, back to the motivation. The motivation was we work with organizations. We want them to use more models. We need to know how to break down that bias. You, don't, you can't prescribe anything until you better understand why it exists. Because and if you give someone a model and they don't use it, you might as well not give no, it. No, it's, it's, it's <laughs> believe me, it's frustrating. We've been down that road a few times. Yeah. And now is there anything, what's next for this research? We, a, a, a couple of ideas are, uh, you know, we, we continue to play with some factors that might contribute to the people's reluctance to use algorithms, but we also want more real world tests of it. So if we go work with professionals with real money at stake, do they fall into the same biases and is there, is, are there ways for us to help them? So we've, we've, we have a couple of organizations we've talked to over time and, and they're interested in running experiments on their employees or their own, on their customers to see if what we see in the lab takes place in the field as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you both so much for being with us today. Yeah, thanks thank a lot. You.